All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ronnie Jelm. I'm vice president of Democrats of the Red Rocks. Um, Kathy Rutherford, our president, is off in the hinterlands somewhere <laughs> and um, not able to get any, near any Wi-Fi. So she asked me to um, lead this meeting. And um, I welcome everybody. It should be a wonderful meeting. Um, we do have a number of announcements that we'll try to keep as short as possible so that our speakers will have plenty of time. But first, um, some very sad news, and maybe most of you know that Barbara Luttrell has passed away, a really wonderful, wonderful person and a great loss not only personally, but to the whole community. And um, Kathy Kinsella and Holly Plug are going to say just a little bit about her and we'll have a moment of silence for Barbara. So go ahead. And just so you know, this is being recorded. And if you don't want your face recorded, you can stop the video on, uh, on Zoom. So go ahead, Kathy and Holly. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, yeah, Kathy asked Holly and me to say a few words about Barbara Luttrell. We are all just reeling from the loss of Barbara. Barbara Luttrell, <laughs> her name is voluminous. It's synonymous with democratic values, civil rights, community activism, teaching and mentoring, which are not always the same thing, caring and just living one's values. When Chris and I moved here, we saw Barbara's name everywhere. It was in the Red Rock News, it was on press releases, it was this class is being hosted by, this organization, it was everywhere. If there was a cause, Barbara was connected to it. I first met her through an Ollie class and it was truly better than meeting any celebrity that I'd ever met. Uh, I remember the first time that she remembered my name, which was about our third meeting, I felt so special. Uh, Barbara did that to people. She she had a way of making everybody feel special, like they had a special connection. She was and she will forever be a dynamo. Influence and energy like that, they don't go away. They live on in the lasting effects of her impact. And Barbara knew the influence and impact that she had. She wasn't shy about it. She knew. She was always saying that, you know, she was fine, you know, being part of a group as long as she was in charge, you know. <laughs> She took her role seriously and responsibly. She knew that she was a leader. She knew that people looked up to her and followed her guidance on issues. Yet there was not an ounce of arrogance about Barbara. She was generous of spirit and she brought out the best in people. She got people to take on things that they may not have otherwise and they grew in that process and became leaders themselves. I was so flattered when she asked me to succeed her as president of the League of Women Voters. Admittedly, she was beating the bushes to find people to take on that role, but I still was very flattered. <laughs> it was an organization that she'd increased from 35 to over 200 people, although Donald Trump may have helped with that a lot too. Uh, but she increased the presence and the vitality of every organization that she touched. And she also had a laugh that I just loved and think of it often. I actually really, I cry in a good way when I think of her laugh. Um, so with that, I'll come back and say a little bit more in a minute, but I know Holly, I'd like to ask you to chime in. You know, I, uh, I first met Barbara. I don't even know how I first met her exactly, but from the second that I met her, I knew that she was really special. And I worked with her on a number of interesting programs for the Sedona women. And we were trying to bring a different uh, perspective to Sedona women about civics and, and social responsibility. And so we did a civics quiz. And, uh, and, and it, was, it was modeled after something that Barbara had done uh, in another venue with a, it, with a different group, with the league. And so I said, can we do that program for Sedona women? So of course, uh, somehow or another, it was my program, but she was in charge. <laughs> She's very good at collaborating. She, she was very good at collaborating when she was in charge. <laughs> so I thought, okay, this is different. I'll let it go, I'll, I'll go with this. Uh, and, uh, 
and then I just became my usual competitive self. And instead of running the program, I was on a team that had to win <laughs> the first civics. Uh, but you know, we we know Barbara. She was she was uh, a resident of the Verde Valley for 20 years. But maybe people don't know about her background. She was born in 1944, and she was raised in the Bronx. So it's not only Kathy Kinsella that has the license plate, Bronx girl. And she graduated uh, at, from uh, Good Counsel College in majored in French and education, and she taught French for seven years before she went to the New York Times, where she joined in 1972 in the advertising department. As she became more involved with, with uh, newspapers and magazines, she became the publisher of McCall's Working Women and Working Mother. And I can remember uh, a company that I worked for, and you know, McCall's and uh, was more, it was like a woman's magazine, not very progressive, not very forward thinking until Barbara arrived and she changed the dynamics. And I can remember, uh, as I previously said, a, a, a company I worked for who wanted desperately to be acknowledged and recognized by working women as a leader in, in taking care of women and promoting women. And, and that wouldn't have been there without Barbara. In 2002, she moved to Arizona, hit the ground running, even though she was here to retire and play golf. She became president of KSB, the League of Women Voters, and the University Women of Sedona. Then she ran for city council, where she was a member from 2010 to 2014. Now, she belonged to any number of different groups. So I know uh, I, I'm going to be leaving something out but uh, her true passion and love became the Mental Health Coalition. And under her leadership, it, actually she formed it. She, she uh, moved forward with it. She worked tires, tirelessly with, uh, uh, with uh, police, well, actually it wasn't the police chief, it was the sar uh, sheriff, Masher. And uh, she changed the whole dynamics of mental health and jails and created programs that didn't exist before. At the same time, she was still doing the political book club for the League of Women Voters. Somewhere around either before, during, or after, she was uh, part of the formation of the Sedona Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. And after she was diagnosed with stage three cancer, she and Peggy Stark formed a publishing company and she pub after she was diagnosed, and she published her, her own book, Meditations with Maggie. This woman was phenomenal. When I was asked recently to name a local person who made a huge difference in my life and for whom I would say was a mentor, it, it, it took me three seconds to say Barbara Luttrell. Even though I work with the most fabulous women uh, on this call and, and uh, in, the, in other parts of my life. Uh, she just was the most special person. Uh, Barbara has asked if anyone wants to donate uh, in her name to donate to the League of Women Voters Education Fund or the charity of your choice. Kathy? So Barbara, true to form, she did not want accolades or a fuss. She did not want any sort of public service. We wanted to acknowledge her today, but we are going to end this and, and keep this brief. So what we're asking is that we have this meeting today, that we hold this meeting in Barbara's spirit. That means that when the meeting is over, we go out and you do something. You make a call, write a letter, help someone, donate somewhere, do, just do something and dedicate it to Barbara. So with that, we do want to end with a moment of silence. We ask you please to gather your favorite thought of Barbara, hold that in your, in your heart and in your mind for the moment, and we'll do a moment of silence. Thank Before you. we do that, I need to acknowledge, of course, she was the secretary of our organization, right. DOOR, member right. of the board and the secretary of our organization. Right. So please think of Barbara now.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank to you Barbara. very much. Um, Barbara. And, yeah, and in the spirit of Barbara, we're going to get down to business. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to mention one thing that um, make sure that everyone knows that our office is now open. The door office is open on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 11 to 3. And something that's important that's going on at the office right now um, is um, there are petitions to be signed. Um, maybe Ellen can, um, Toby was supposed to be here, but I don't see her. Toby's here. Oh, she Toby's is? Here. Yes. Okay. Toby, you're muted. Ah, okay. Toby, can you, can you speak about very briefly about the petitions that are at the office to be signed? And then, and then make a quick um, little uh, announcement about an upcoming event. Okay, so um, when we had requests to speak, there were some uh, bills and the bills uh, were um, passed by the legislature were terrible. And there's a group called um, Arizona Deserves Better and they have some petitions and Dora's going to allow um, people to sign them at the office. So they're at the office now and they're about the voting bills. So we're asking people, as Ronnie said, the office is open now from on Tuesdays, Thursdays, I think still Saturdays. Yeah. If you could come by the office and sign the, those petitions, there's two, they're going to be four but the board hasn't um, approved two of them so um, those are there the dark money petition again they're going to try and make this a, a law and they have um, a lot of time for um, that petition you can come by the office you can take out a petition or you can sign the petition also you can email me and I have petitions at my house um, I'd like to leave one in my political coolers so that you could just come by my house, sign the petition, and, and you're done. I wanted to say one more thing about the one for Arizona Deserves Better. Half, they have to be done 90 days from the close of the um, Arizona um, uh, session. So uh, there's probably 80 days left, and those are really important for you to sign. So if you're interested in getting rid of some of those voting bills, come by the office. And Ronnie, did you want me to talk about the picnic now too? Yes, you might as well, just really quick. Okay, I'm gonna segue into um, the picnic. The um, We're having a picnic on Sunday, October 17th from three to six, so save the date. I'll just say it real quickly. If you're a pie maker, um, please um, plan on making a pie. We're gonna have a pie contest. We're going to have a lot of um, music there. Local people are going to be um, involved and we're going to have things like um, uh, guessing how many jelly beans are in the jar. How much does a, um, a the watermelon weigh? And we're gonna have, we have lots of other games. So I'll probably ask Shelly to send out an email and um, have you guys save the date. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, let's see, we need um, some volunteers. So I'll put my um, address in the chat or I'll ask Shelly to put it in and you can contact me and uh, we'll have, um, I'll have you help with the picnic. Thanks everybody. Thank you and thanks for all that you do. Um, I just want to mention one of the other petitions uh, at the office waiting to be signed has to do with Pebble, uh, permanent early voting. And um, they passed, a law was passed by the state to um, that if you don't vote by mail in, um, I think it's four, two or four um, elections that you get knocked off of Pebble. And so they're, uh, they're gonna eliminate the word permanent from, from Pebble. So if you sign this petition and we get in, they get enough signatures, then that will go up on a ballot um, to vote on whether people want to continue it as permanent or not. Um, so these are very important um, petitions. And if you can come by the office and sign them, that would be great. And we'd appreciate it. Um, 10, oh, um, I'd like to call upon um, Holly 
uh, who's going to uh, talk about our, our IRC. Thank you, uh, Ronnie. The IRC is the Independent Redistricting Commission. All of our legislative and congressional districts will be um, redone as part of the census. This takes place every 10 years. This will be the third, uh, third time that the independent commission is drawing the lines as opposed to the legislature, one of, one of 19 states, I think, that has an independent commission. Uh, they are coming here to Sedona on July 27th. And they will be at Yavapai College, room 34, you're all familiar with it, uh, at five o'clock. This will be a satellite location to uh, Prescott, but we'll be able to testify in person there and we need to fill up the room. Uh, our friend, Wendy Rogers has uh, really organized very well. And is, we expect her, that she will be bringing, uh, not necessarily in person, but that they're going to be uh, filling, they are going to be there en masse. We need people. Even if you do not want to speak, uh, we need you to attend. Probably looking at two hours. And uh, it's really important that we show solidarity for our side. The uh, people who would like to speak, we're writing up notes for you on the types of of comments that we expect would be worthwhile. The Sedona City Council approved a statement of values to keep the Verde Valley together. And they are going to be reading that into the record. It turns out that it's on the night that the council meets. So neither Kathy or I will be able to be there, but Toby and Ellen and others will. And so if you want to testify, which we really need people to do as well, please put your name in the chat and we'll get back with you and help you to form your, your uh, testimony. It, you only have three or four minutes to speak and some people speak for a lot less than that. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. And I'd like to turn the meeting now over to Ellen who's arranged for so, uh, two very, very interesting speakers talking about what's happening down in Phoenix at the legislature. Go ahead, Ellen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is going to be a great program. We have Melinda Iyer from the Civic Engagement Beyond Voting and uh, the minority leader of the Arizona House of Representatives, Reginald Boulding. He will be joining us shortly, but I see that Melinda is on along with Kathy Sigman from Civic Engagement. Um, before I say anything else, I have to wish Melinda a happy birthday. She's doing this on her birthday. So Yay. join me. In. <laughs> Congratulations, happy birthday, Melinda. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here with us during, to do this. Um, Melinda is one of these people that is literally a superwoman. She must have 26 or 27 hours in her day because she has two young children and a life and during the legislative session, she devotes that life to um, requests to speak and analyzing legislation and what's happening at the state legislature. And she has come up with analysis for almost every piece of legislation that comes through there. It's civic engagement has just done a fabulous job. So thank you, Melinda and Kathy for the fabulous work you guys do. It's just, how many of you here on the call uh, have used requests to speak? And if you have, then you have no doubt looked at the analysis that they have performed. And it is absolutely uh, staggering, the, the sheer volume of it. And the, the thorough bipartisan, and now I won't say bipartisan, I'll say nonpartisan nonpartisan analysis that they do is just terrific. So thank you for all you do. Um, Melinda also helped found Save Our Schools. Her passion is edu education and public education. And so I won't take any more time. Let's hear from Melinda. And if Kathy, you wanna chime in, please do. We welcome you both and appreciate your being here. Well, thank you. And thank you everybody for taking time out of your day um, to attend this meeting and 
uh, hear about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the 50, 55th legislature first general session. Kathy, do you want to add anything before I get started? No, Melinda, I think we should just jump right in. <laughs> okay, let me figure out how to share my screen. Give me a minute here, folks. Yeah, I guess while you're doing that, Melinda, I'll just say that um, civic engagement beyond voting was formed by just a few women who discovered that the request to speak system was available. So we started going down to the Capitol and registering people. And our growth has just been so, so exciting. We've registered probably well over 10,000 people for request to speak. Wow. And um, uh, thanks to Melinda's uh, legislative analysis, we've been able to help people use it. We train people to use the system. And uh, we believe our organization supports direct democracy. And uh, we also serve as a force multiplier for other groups around the state who, such as redistricting, to uh, help people have an active role in their government. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in with the session uh, session wrap up. Um, we're going to cover the good, believe it or not, there was good in this session, the bad, the ugly, failed bills that we stopped from passing, um, a sneak preview at the 2022 ballot, and our next steps of, of what we can do. So, um, like I said, believe it or not, there was good in this past legislative session. Uh, we saw a bill pass to ban suspensions and expulsions of our youngest students, which is an equity issue because early childhood suspensions and expulsions disproportionately benefit um, or affect children of color. Um, and the bill wasn't perfect. It was lacking money for teacher training and an increase in school counselors, but it was a good first step. Um, and 2395, sponsored by uh, Jennifer Longden, is a disability issue, an accessibility issue um, for access to those private sidewalks that um, might have been blocked. Child safety issue, because uh, you know if you're blocking the sidewalk, you might not be able to see a child running. And also a structural integrity issue for sidewalks not meant to bear the weight of vehicles. They are small things, but um, you know, good to see them pass. Um, Senator Sean Bowie got his mental health bill through. This has been a priority of his for a number of years. Um, and like I said, we do still need more funding for counselors and services, but this is a reasonable way for schools to offer students some assistance and relief. Um, allowing them to take a mental health day. And Senator Marsh's fentanyl bill um, helps detect the illicit cutting of fentanyl into black market opioids, which fentanyl is the most dangerous drug in a, probably a generation. It's cheap and strong and used as a filler and uh, took the life of her own son, Landon. So this is, this is an issue that I'm very heartened to see have passed. Um, Senator Navarrete got his bill through to care for pregnant people in jail and um, compassionate care for pregnant inmates and for women in general, mandating a sufficient supply of menstrual hygiene products. Um, and this is a bill that the governor vetoed when he had his 22 bill temper tantrum that was then reintroduced and passed again. Um, so this is a good bill that passed twice. Um, unfortunately, there was also the bad. Um, Senator Eugenti Rita did manage to get um, her ballot curing bill through, um, codifying a court decision from last year, uh, rejecting the previous common practice of, of uh, county recorders allowing voters five days to cure missing or mismatched signatures. Um, so this one was not a surprise given that it was codifying a court decision, but you know we still don't like to see it in statute. Um, and House Bill 2111 um, 
designs Arizona to be set up to preemptively ignore any federal laws, um, such as ones the Biden administration might pass regarding assault weapons ban or red flag laws. Uh, federal law does supersede state law. So this one is, is uh, a lawsuit waiting to happen and uh, really puts law enforcement in an awkward position. Um, Michelle Udall passed some pretty bad bills this session, uh, so bad that we have her picture on the slide twice. Uh, both of these bills were wrapped into the budget. Um, the teacher gag bill did pass and it was softened somewhat to assign the fine to the uh, school or the district in, rather than the teacher, which is how it was originally written, but still not great. Um, and then 2404, the unregulated crisis pregnancy program that really only pushes uh, pregnant people toward the single option of adoption does not inform them of all their issues. This was a Center for Arizona policy bill, and that is the third straight year that Kathy Herod pushed to get that bill passed, and it finally did pass, uh, did so by being embedded into the budget. Uh, Senator Boyer also deserves to have his picture up here twice. Um, he authored a school district boundaries bill, which um, which basically creates a Schrodinger's box for schools. If you're familiar with that um, concept, it's um, anyway, um, it, it's a paradox concept. And so this bill forces a uh, public school to guarantee space for all students within its district, but also to reserve space for all out of district students who apply given sufficient space. So it's, it's a planning and budgetary nightmare. Um, and part of the push to continually throw up obstacles in the path of our neighborhood public schools, weakening them and making it easier to prop up the for-profit alternatives. So that was very disappointing to see pass. And then the, the companion bill on this slide um, would cover, for example, an Uber to school or private driving service. Um, I don't know if they've made it up to the Northern Arizona area, but in Maricopa County, we see lots of uh, van pool services for um, families to send their kids to private school. And this continues the method first tried with ESA vouchers of paying the parent for services, which is an accountability nightmare. Um, it's worth pointing out that charter schools already get additional funding for transportation and most have offered not to offer transportation services and they have allocated the funding for other things. Uh, meanwhile, many of our district buses sit in disrepair and district schools are um, continuously underfunded. So that's another really disappointing further step towards the privatization of our public schools. Um, and we did see uh, some voucher action as well. Uh, the big so-called big voucher bill 1452 did not pass, although some of its technical provisions were wrapped into the budget, uh, but we did see some lesser known voucher actions. So um, 529 vouchers, those were expanded in 2017 to be not just for college savings anymore, but for K-12 private education. And this changed um, rather than just deducting a certain amount per tax filer, you can now deduct per beneficiary. So if you have three kids, you've seen your dollar for dollar tax deduction triple, which drains, you know, one of every two tax dollars is, is basically earmarked for the uh, for state public schools. So that is a further drain on revenues. Um, and 1118, um, increasing a specific type of STO voucher, um, that includes an annual um, automatic escalator. So they've you know, guaranteed that the program will continue to balloon, um, but these aren't even the worst of it. You know, Bills like this are pretty typical of what we would see in any legislative year because after all, this is Arizona. Um, so all of that could have happened in any other session, but there are some bills that were just truly jaw dropping that made this session um, a standout in terms of being unusual and harmful. Um, you know, Senator Eugenti Rita's voting rights bill, which uh, purges voters from the rolls and 
does away with the permanent early voting list, which is now called the active early voter list. This disproportionately uh, affects people who choose to vote in person but receive their ballots in the mail. So if you don't utilize that early ballot, like you know, if you if you just hold on to it, review it, and then uh, go down, request a new ballot, and vote in person, it would affect you. And it also affects independent voters who would have to specifically request a partisan primary ballot. Uh, they don't just get those automatically. They have to select a party and request a ballot. So if they fail to mail back a ballot for two general elections in a row and they also don't vote the primaries, they risk getting kicked off Pavel. And estimates put this at purging about 225,000 voters statewide. Another really ugly one uh, is 1457 sponsored by Nancy Barto, uh, which grants, um, and I'm quoting directly from the bill, unborn children at every stage of development the same rights as an actual person. And this is part of a national coordinated push uh, for these bills, probably designed as a test balloon for our newly radicalized stacked Supreme Court. Um, here's another ugly bill. This is the um, one of the three bad tax bills that passed, and this one allows wealthy individuals to call themselves small businesses for the purposes of, of filing Arizona state income taxes. And, and it includes Schedule B, which is interest and dividends. So if you see the majority of your income from investments, even if you don't take the step of creating an LLC and actually calling yourself a small business, you are mostly exempt from state taxes. So this is this is another bill that disproportionately benefits the wealthy at the expense of our general fund and pretty much everything here in our state. Uh, the tax omnibus bill is uh, the second part of that uh, ugly trifecta, um, which uh, legislative analysts are, are saying that uh, 53%, so over half the benefits will go to 0.3% of Arizonans, our, our state's wealthiest. Uh, while the majority of us, you know, I think I'm getting $47 personally, um, rather than 350. So I get a tank of gas and the wealthiest individuals in the state can buy a new Porsche every year. Um, and that amounts to roughly one third of the revenues that Prop 208 was intended to raise per year. And really what this is, is a missed opportunity. And it's, it's beyond disappointing and sad. And um, Leader Bolding, who will be speaking after me, really put it well in this quote when he said, we are a politically purple state. We had a $2 billion surplus and we blew it. You know, we had a once in a generation opportunity to step up and change all these things that were so underfunded, our public schools, our water rights, um, health care, affordable housing, you know, roads and infrastructure, and we gave the revenue away. But while that is bad, it could have been so much worse. Majority lawmakers also wanted to pass these laws. Um, and these aren't the ones like um, allowing the legislature to overturn the results of a presidential election. You know, those, those big bills that um, attracted international attention and never got a hearing. Like these are bills that we actively fought because they actually could have passed. And it was, um, it was due to, you know, voices of uh, caring individuals all over the state, like the people in this Zoom. Um, that were the reason that these bills did not pass. You know, cutting property taxes for public schools in half, um, chaining individual income tax rates to state growth so they can never go up, um, banning the abuse, prohibiting banning conversion therapy, which is, um, which is an abusive practice against our LGBTQ community. Um, you know, banning cities from reallocating state funding to crisis counseling and other services that are commonly thought of as defunding the police, uh, voting rights, so many voting rights attacks, um, cutting unemployment benefits, you know, banning nearly all abortions, which would have been another uh, Roe v. Wade test case, and the transgender uh, 
transgender girls um, attack that we saw last session. All of these could have actually passed and we were able to stop them, which is fantastic and so much more than I expected from this session. Um, so the 2022 ballot, um, and it's, it's worth saying that usually our lawmakers don't refer things to the ballot in the first session of a two-year term. Usually they wait until an election year to see what else is going to be on the ballot and sort of get the lay of the land. But we have, we have things that will be on our 2022 ballot already. So we know that it's going to be crowded. Um, we have this um, Voter Protection Act attack, which um, would allow lawmakers to amend uh, a measure with a simple majority if a court says they're illegal or unconstitutional. So this would have allowed lawmakers to do away with Prop 208 because a lower court said that it was unconstitutional. And even though that decision was overturned, the law is not that specific. So, um, you know, they would have probably gone ahead and just done away with Prop 208 altogether if this law had been on the books. We have the single subject initiative rule, which, um, Lawmakers have been wanting that for a long time that would have disallowed the minimum wage increase that we saw on the ballot a couple years ago and will make it very difficult, if not impossible, to run comprehensive citizen initiatives in the future. Um, and then we have uh, something good, actually, granting in-state college tuition to dreamers. And I, I worry a little about that one because uh, everything else on the ballot will likely be a no and there will be this one yes. And so I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that folks can find their way through you know, the, the confusing, complicated and crowded ballot and vote that one yes and CEBV will be working on, uh, on voter outreach. But the takeaway from all of this is uh, I love this graphic. Don't panic, organize. So individually, you know, we are we are easy to pick off, but collectively we have so much power and so much strength and we can do so much together. Um, and there are next steps, you know, even though this horrific legislative session is in the books, it's not truly over because some measures will be challenged in court. I believe the voting rights laws are uh, preeminent um, among that, that, that folks are, are gonna mount legal challenges. Referendum efforts, I, I believe there are six. There might actually be more. And some of those, like the, the voting rights ones, if they don't get challenged in court, they, they will be superseded by S1 at the federal level which you know, we, we all should be you know, pushing Senator Sinema to um, do what's necessary to get that law on the books. Uh, the, the flat tax is forever. You know, that would require a nearly impossible two thirds. So um, I, I encourage you to, to prioritize the tax bills um, when we're talking about referendum efforts and, and to stay tuned. You know, CEBV will be here for all of it. We will, uh, you know, we will lead you by the hand, as it were, and provide information on all the next steps and everything that is to come, um, as we did in 2021. So I wrote 23 weeklies, and I, I, I might have um, just hid under the bed in January if I had known that was what was coming, uh, but 23 weeklies. Um, tracking 426 bills, which is a very sharp increase from where we started five years ago. Um, we conducted 82 requests to speak trainings. Um, and I, I don't recall if, if Dor had one or not, but I believe you did. Um, and we had so many trainers who helped to make this a reality, which is just amazing. Um, we registered a jaw-dropping 2,373 people for requests to speak, and our runners put themselves at risk. You know, they risked COVID to go into the Capitol buildings and, and make this happen week after week. So we really thank them for that. Um, trained over 2,000 people to use that system. We held 24 online happy hours, which regularly we had over 100 people at those happy hours, which is really outstanding. Um, from every legislative district in the state. 
and our um, Twitter followers, we saw a, a tripling um, over the 2021 session. So our social media team did fantastic work. Um, and of course, all of this uh, is so much easier with funding. So if you have a few extra bucks in your pocket to throw towards our work in 2022 and beyond, we, we would definitely appreciate that. And, and every cent goes towards our outreach and other efforts. Um, I encourage you to follow us on our website and social media. Um, you know, stay, stay in touch with us. Sign up for our email list if you are not already on it. We only use it for good. We're, we're never going to spam you. And if you have any questions, you can send an email to the address listed. So um, with that, I'm not sure if I have time for questions, but um, I'll throw it back to Ellen. Yes, we do have a little time for questions. Um, but first, I wanted to ask Kathy, would you describe the accountability project for everybody here? Oh, um, because we have several people one. on the screen um, that are participating in the accountability project, and I'm loving it right now. So Kathy, could yeah. you tell people about that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, Shelly, I think you can put down the screen, the share screen now. Okay. Thanks. Um, absolutely happy to talk about that. It is one of the several projects that we're working on leading up to the 2022 election, which is going to be an incredibly important one for Arizona. All of our statewide offices are up for election and of course, every single legislator. And as I'm sure many of you know, we are one seat away from tying both the Arizona House and the Arizona Senate. And if we had not allowed our LD4 seat to slip away by a very small amount in the last election, all of this horrible legislation would not have been able to get through. So um, that is how important these seats are. So we have one of the uh, things that we discovered from the 2020 2020 election was that, you know, although our state went for Biden and Mark Kelly, um, people reverted to their tribe when they started voting down ballot. And a lot of that is because people are living their lives. They're not following the news. You know, a, a significant number of people are not radicalized. They are just taking their kids to school and, you know, going to the PTA and having a social life. And um, they're not really paying attention to who is on the ballot. So when it comes to the down ballot races, which we as civic engagement, we're very passionate about that. People just go back to their, you know, whatever they're historically used to voting for. So it's our job through the accountability project um, to start um, tying some of these legislators to the bad policies and the bad um, legislation that they are supporting. One of the things that's absolutely key to this project is addressing persuadable voters in a persuasion, in a manner of persuasion. And that means not giving in to our you know, speaking within our bubble to people who already agree with us. So we are avoiding um, any of the issues that drive people into their partisan corners. Um, we're not talking about parties. We're not, you know, Democrat or Republican. We're not talking about red or blue. We're not talking about left or right. We're talking about issues that matter to people in their daily lives. And that includes healthcare. Um, it includes infrastructure, broadband, particularly for rural areas. Um, it includes, you know, filling the pothole in front of your house. And as Melinda said, this legislative session, we have squandered the ability to invest in these projects that are meaningful to people in their communities. I thought it was laughable that Ducey uh, tweeted about his fabulous investment in drug intervention, $5 million, which given the scope of our opioid crisis, 
will do nothing. And we could have invested a hundred million or more in a program that would really have helped people in their lives, in their communities. So through our accountability project, we have created teams of people who are working on tying specific legislators to the bad legislation that they have, have passed or supported or sponsored. And it takes um, multiple, multiple, multiple repetitions of the same message to really reach out to people and get them to make that connection and, and sort of incorporate it as part of their, their vocabulary so that they can recognize that on the 22 ballot. So we have fielded four fairly large teams. They are working all over Arizona. They have researched areas that are specific um, to those communities, many of which are, are important to all Arizonans, such as mental health care, particularly coming out of the pandemic, very, very important to people. Um, and they are starting to lay the groundwork for linking these legislators to those issues in such a way that they show that those legislators are destroying or, or preventing services that people need in their communities. So it's going to be a long-term project. Um, we're very excited to be up and running in four different teams. And if you are interested in joining one of those teams, um, I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you. That's, it's fascinating. Uh, the person who is the leader of the team that I'm on and Marilyn Bernhardt is on the same team. Uh, David Patchen is on this call as well. And we are specifically researching and we'll be writing letters to the editor and doing a lot more. Uh, we are looking into Walt Blackman and Wendy Rogers and we, uh, and we are laser focused on the two of them and we're hoping that we will see some results. Um, I, let me see, what time is it? I think, does anybody have any questions for our friends here at Civic Engagement? Uh, you guys have, been, have just been doing such a fabulous job. I don't know how you get funded. I mean, this group started as an indivisible group, just like Indivisible Sedona and after the March Verde Valley. How do you get funded? I mean, do you get any compensation for what you're doing? I mean, other than the gratifying feelings that you have. We are volunteers. And um, although we have been able to get a little bit of funding this year, the vast majority of what we do is purely volunteer. We have been able to expand our leadership team and expand our our group of trainers. Um, and it gives me enormous pride to say that we have people who are participating from all over the state, um, every single area. So um, we depend on individual donations. We do pretty much everything we do on, a, on the craziest shoestring you can imagine, or maybe you can imagine. So um, I know Melinda always likes to talk about um, you know, all the issues and all the things that we've been doing. And she tells me, okay, you make the ask um, for money. <laughs> so I put, a, I put our link for donations in the, in the chat. And thank you all so much for your support. And thank you, Ellen, for all the kind words. Well, you guys have been invaluable during this entire process. And I also love your Sunday night happy hours, four o'clock on Sundays. They explain what legislation is pertinent, what, what needs to be done, and then they always have someone from the state legislature there to address uh, the group, and it's, it's fascinating. So um, thank you both so much for being here, especially Melinda, to take the time out on your birthday. <laughs> um, we appreciate it. Well, I can't think of a better birthday present than to be in a room with people who care deeply about our state and making it a better place. I really mean that. Like, this is so gratifying to be in this space with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, our second speaker, or I guess third, Kathy Counts, uh, speaker of the morning, uh, legis uh, 
uh, minority leader Reginald Boulding has joined the call as well. And we welcome you uh, to our Democrats of the Red Rocks meeting. We appreciate your spending the time with us. We know how busy you are. Uh, we had wanted to have him speak in May and then the session didn't end. And then we thought, okay, we'll move it to June. And then the session didn't end. And then we moved it to July. So thank goodness you're able to join us now. We appreciate it. Um, I, I'm going to cut the introduction short so that you'll have more time to speak. Everyone saw the, um, the many, many accomplishments that you have achieved on the notice, the flyer for this meeting. And uh, we just, we're so glad that you're here because we want to, we wanted to get into the nitty gritty with Kathy and Melinda, but but you have a perspective that very, very few people have. And we just wanted you to talk about what it's been like to be a part of this session and what your impressions are and um, how can we help? So no, welcome. No, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, this morning. Um, so just a, a little bit about me, like my orientation, what brings me to this space. I started uh, and moved to Arizona uh, 13 years ago to become a classroom teacher. So I taught special education, uh, math, and, and uh, English language arts, and then went on to ASU to become a teacher as well. So the legislature and education is really what brought me to this fight. And uh, you know what we saw in 2008, and even prior to that, was uh, a, an immediate funding shift with regards to the amount of money that we're putting in our education system versus the amount of money we're putting in our incarceration system. You literally can see the inverse. Um, we now spend more uh, in corrections than we do in higher education. You literally see that trend. Um, and that trend has continued. And, and now we're looking at other areas outside of just education in which we are seeing literally the dismantling of what it means to have a public government system that is fighting and that's there to provide a stopgap for, for our people. I mean, this legislative session literally, literally was a tale of, of two sessions. Um, and uh, we started you know, with the largest Democratic caucus since 1966. Uh, so there were 29 members of my caucus, um, and, and this was uh, also when we saw, you know, uh, the state turn blue for Biden, two Democratic senators, you know, I, I sat on, the, on a call with the Speaker of the House um, right after we both were elected by our caucuses to be the leaders, and I said, look, you know, this state is a lot more purple than it is red or blue. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to really get some work done. We have three billion dollar. We have a three billion dollar surplus. Um, we also have a global crisis that is happening. This is an area where we should be talking about what can we do collectively together. Um, and in every single uh, pre-session uh, panel and conversation that we had, the president of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, myself, we all we kumbaya. We were like, yes, we're going to do this together. Um, the moment session hit what we saw was a, a Republican legislative agenda that was designed to do uh, three things. One, it was designed to uh, uh, in introduce legislation that would be some of the largest attacks on issues that we care most fundamentally about. So whether it's reproductive justice, uh, democracy, education, these were all things, uh, that, you know, tax reform, these were all things that they knew that they were gonna do. Um, uh, second, their other approach uh, was to create a narrative that can then distract um, our public away from what they actually were intending to do with policy. Because a lot of people are talking about the, the, the fake audit and things that are happening down at the Coliseum, while the real damage is being done by some of these voter restriction bills at the state capitol that will last well beyond what's the circus that's happening at the Coliseum. Um, and then also the third piece was that they knew, and they actually said this publicly, I don't know if they realized they were on camera, one of the members of the um, uh, Republican caucus said, if we don't pass these bills now, there's a chance that we will never get an opportunity to do it again. So they see the trend 
of them losing power. So for them, this past year was how can we throw as much as we can on the wall and hope that it sticks. Um, so with that said, we know that there were a lot of bills that you know really undercut the fabric of what it meant to to have a strong Arizona. But there were also a lot of wins because I, I we often tell this a, a single story when it comes down to the legislature. And I want you all to know that there are a lot of wins that we had this prior year. Um, uh, the Democratic caucus was able to pass more bills this year than the last six years combined. That means that we have bills that were directly impacting um, everything from our disability community to our foster youth, um, bills that were protecting you know, women who were sexually assaulted. Um, so uh, there were uh, pieces of legislation that pr uh, protected our, our indigenous people community. So we were able to get a lot of wins. And, and I think that was, um, a, 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 that was great for us because it allowed us to really push some of the legislation that we always knew. And we also were able to stick together in opposition to really make sure that we were able to push against some of the, the conversations that um, the governor's office wanted to pursue. Uh, specifically, I, I'll start on democracy. One, you know, there was bill so as a, so bad that it would require literally a Jim Crow type poll tax, which would have required all of you to take your photo ID, put it on a photocopier, uh, copy it, and then put that copy into a mail-in ballot, a mail-in um, envelope to then have your vote count, right? Like that was a that was a bill. We had other bills that would have required you to actually. Uh, get your ballot notarized, right? Um, I mean, they were really, really aggressive in how they were trying to make it more difficult to stop the mail-in ballot uh, approach and system, which we believe is actually going to hurt them in the long run. Because the reality is, is when you create these broad strokes of voter restriction bills, the bills and the language, it doesn't care if you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent. We know it can disproportionately impact Democrats, but it will also impact uh, Republican voters as well. And I think that they're gonna uh, really find themselves in a position where it's gonna be very difficult for them to, to claw back from some of those cuts that they that they made. Um, here, what, what we saw was uh, the Democratic caucus was able to um, uh, negotiate uh, for $90 million in uh, American Rescue Plan money. Um, that we'll be able to use on any priorities that we want that will directly impact um, issues that matter most to uh, our constituents. And that's a huge win um, to be able to walk into our communities to say, look, if you need support, whether it's you know with food or whether it's with housing um, or, 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 or anything in between, that's gonna allow us you know, throughout this year and next year to provide instant resources for our communities uh, to make sure that they have the ability uh, to utilize those uh, resources. So uh, that hasn't been, uh, you may have not publicly seen that or read about that or heard about that, but that is a, a big win that we've been able to do and accomplish. And I think that's gonna be huge. Um, and, and then we know that 2022 uh, could possibly be a year of not only a ton of candidates on the ballot, referendums and initiatives as well. I mean. Literally, there are uh, so many bad policies that went through the legislature this year that citizens have decided to literally and, and figuratively roll up their sleeves to say, we're going to do whatever we can to push back on these policies, um, whether it's, you know, uh, the, the largest tax giveaway in Arizona history, you know, literally uh, one and a half billion dollars out of our general fund every year that will be literally given away. Um, that will make it even more difficult for us to fund the things that we care most about. Um, uh, that to uh, 1485, which uh, essentially will, which we have called the Pebble Purge, removing nearly 200,000 people from our permanent early voting list. So, um, you know, uh, behind the scenes, um, it, it, there's been a lot of things that have been tough within our caucus because we really wanted to make sure that we approach this year with a mindset of there's $3 billion. Um, how can we amplify and work to get uh, our communities the resources that they need at the same time? Uh, talk about you know the missed priorities that Republicans have, because quite frankly, there's no Democratic bill that can get passed without a Republican member voting for it. Um, but our members were incredibly uh, disciplined. Um, they showed a ton of integrity. 
Uh, and, and that allowed for us to, to really have a, a, a dual narrative um, to specifically allow us to, you know, push back against legislation at the same time pass legislation as well. Um, I do want uh, to open a space up, though, because I think that sometimes that there are things that happen behind the scenes that um, for me that I, I, I take for granted because I've been doing it for the last seven years, but I, I'm also interested and any questions that you all have about whether uh, uh, something got passed or didn't got, get passed or something that you read in, in the, the paper that you wanted to see, what was the behind the scenes by that? Because I really think that's more of a valuable space and place for me here, as opposed to just kind of giving you a list of what did happen. Um, uh, Cause I, I really want to be able to provide some of that behind the scenes. Thank you. Let me, let me start by uh, referring to something that Melinda mentioned earlier, which is tax cuts. They passed lots of big tax cuts for the wealthiest citizens. And how does that get undone? Yeah, so so there's there's two ways. Um, the first um, is, you know, uh, a referendum that you referred to the ballot, which we know that's something that's taking place right now. Um, uh, invest in Arizona, they are uh, essentially referring um, provisions of the tax uh, changes to the ballot um, uh, and, and, and going about that process. So that's one, one way voters can decide that this is not the route that we want to go. Um, the other way is with two thirds majority of the state legislature, which is nearly impossible to get. Um, and I think that is why uh, the governor and Republican members they chose to implement this policy right now because they know that even if we take control of the legislature um, in uh, 2023 and beyond, uh, it will be virtually impossible for us to make some of these changes. Um, and I think that's the most disappointing uh, aspect of it. So those are the two ways. Now, to generate revenue, we can think of a whole lot of ways to do that. So we'll have to find other ways to, to generate revenue. Um, and this is important for you to know, I spent the last six years on the Ways and Means Committee. Arizona is funded in three different ways. Um, uh, personal income tax, which accounts for about 33% of the budget. So our personal income tax, that goes into a pot. Um, then uh, we have our TPT, transitional privilege tax, or the same thing as sales tax. That accounts for about 33 to 34% um, of the budget. Um, then you have insurance premium taxes, um, which uh, makes up a, a portion. And then a very small portion you have is a corporate income tax. I mean, the corporate income tax uh, threshold is so small that it, I mean, you very, you can't, you can't really use that for a, a, a lot of things. So when you talk about, you know, our governor has said, you know, we want to um, get rid, we want to bring personal income tax down to zero. The reality is, is the state could not function because such a large portion of our personal income tax, literally one third, a little over one third of everything to, to, for Arizona to function comes from personal income tax. Uh, so that's, um, so that's a little bit there. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mike, Mike Costantino, you want to unmute? Yeah, yes, hi. <clears throat> a, a lot of us thought that um, a lot of people in Arizona thought 108 was going to be the answer to education and and, and forgot about it. So I, I just, and Melinda did say that uh, some of the, it's going to cut out about a third, the, the one bill that seems to be targeting 108. So I just, if there's anything else that those of us that thought 108 was the answer, anything else we should know about how uh, this legislature has attacked or reduced 108? Um, and then, and then, so are you talking about the pro education funding measure? Yes. The, yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. So, um, so that, so that, uh, so, uh, proposition, uh, 208, um, so a proposition oh, 208. There, there um, we go. The wrong number. Sorry. No, no, you're good. 108 makes it hard for us to overturn anything. <laughs> um, that's the two thirds. <laughs> yeah, okay. So they're both bad. They're both bad. Anything that has an 08, we don't like. Um, so, uh, with 208, um, you know, it, it was, you know, I, I got to say, you know, during these off sessions, I, I am convinced that they put themselves in a room and they just lock the door and they say, how can we figure out a way to undercut the system? Uh, I am convinced that they do this consistently across the country here in Arizona. 
Um, and I think that's what they've been really good at figuring out ways to strategize around uh, public policy. So um, what they did um, essentially is uh, as you are filing your taxes, um, and we know Prop 208 was targeting our highest income earners, the top 1% of earners here in Arizona, um, the very wealthy, right? Um, you know, you, you, they've decided to craft and create another, uh, instead of changing Prop you know, 208, that would, again, attack personal income tax, uh, they created another tax category um, to encourage these high income earners to now no longer file using their personal income tax, but file as a small business. So uh, for very rich folks, you may have seen people say, I'm going to take a zero, I'm going to pay myself $1 a year. You know, you see these big CEOs and these corporations say, my salary is going to be $1 a year, or I'm not going to take any salary. Um, for them, they don't make their wealth based on personal income tax. Their wealth comes in forms of distributions and stocks. So the idea of uh, you know, personal income tax for them and, and them saying, hey, we're going to take a $1 or $2, uh, that really, um, that's just a way of them gaming or messaging the system. And what Arizona tax policy did with the gutting of 208 is it essentially encouraged these very wealthy people to no longer um, ensure that their personal income tax is over the $250,000 threshold or $500,000 threshold, and instead pay themselves in forms of distributions uh, to, to LLCs and things of the others. So they, they did that um, to work around the system so they can say, hey, we didn't touch personal income tax. We can't control how tax uh, payers decide to file. Um, but what they what they they did that at the same time they nodded and winked to said hey this is the way you want to now file your taxes uh, that way you can gut the system and then literally it's going to take one nearly one third of all of the revenue that we were going to uh, raise from from Prop 208 out which is just disheartening and we're going to sue because we we're going to sue uh, because we do believe that it's a constitutional violation um, and, and we'll, we'll we'll see what happens there. Thank you. Thank you. Mary I hope I'm not too deep into the weeds, but I'm a, I'm a policy nerd, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Mary Ann Kenny? Yes, thank you uh, very much for being down there fighting the fight for us. We really appreciate that. Um, I have a concern and I have a question. My concern is that if this year was the year of attack on voting rights, next year is going to be the attack on election integrity. So I'm very concerned about possibilities of the legislator pointing their own, uh, you know, overriding the results of the of the election. I'm very concerned about that. And I have a question on the request to speak, which so many of us use. How can we make it most effective? How do how do these legislators look at it? What can we do? What can we say to really get the most out of RTS? Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. No, RTS is important. And I, and, I, and I encourage you all to continue to sign up and continue to use your voice through RTS. Um, as a legislator, um, you know, when I'm looking at bills, one of the things that we have attached to the policy bill is like the names of individuals who requested to speak. And many times you can also see the comments that they make. So that, that's important. And, and lawmakers do look at that. Um, and, and it also creates a, a record and an archive of you know, where the community is at on particular bills. Um, uh, one thing that is uh, extremely crucial in addition to, to that, um, I believe, so lawmakers uh, should be a lot more accessible. And in many cases, they are more accessible than people think. Um, and I would encourage, you know, uh, you know, whether it's phone calls, Zoom calls, um, to directly talk to somebody who's connected to the office of that member, that matters a lot. So like for me, if you call my office, you leave a message, my assistant, she will, she, she's there, she's writing it down. That will, like, I will get it. I will physically get it. Um, many times, you know, in forms of emails, you know, we might get five to 600 emails a day, um, which makes, sometimes it makes it difficult to go through some of those. Um, so, uh, you know, phone calls, direct contact is good. Also, tagging members on social media. You would be amazed on, on how much um, uh, lawmakers are sensitive about their social media. 
Um, and you literally got members like, hey, they're tagging me on, about, on, on social media. Like, I mean, uh, so, uh, you know, a tag on social media is huge because that is a notification that many of them are getting directly to their cell phones and they're seeing it and they're understand they know that you are watching and that you're looking. So let's tag folks like never before, direct message like never before. I think that's important. Um, and it's important, especially if you live in the district of the member to, to indicate that because many assistants have been trained to elevate constituent messages or cause before uh, other uh, folks who are reaching out to lawmakers. So that's going to be important. And with regards to next year, I know you talked about voting rights attacks. I mean, next year, I, I, I cannot even predict how what's what we're in store for next year. I mean, groups like civic engagement and, you know, uh, beyond voting and, and others who are ready, like everyone is gonna need everyone to get involved because not only um, do we have, you know, the election, which, which is gonna be enormously important for the nation, because again, with regards to our US Senate race, um, obviously our, our, our governor's race is gonna be important. Governor Ducey is a lame duck governor now, which in, in some respects, he will lose some power from the legislature. Some of the members will be like, hey, we don't, we're not listening to you. And in other respects, he may say, I have nothing to lose. So that can, that's a whole nother dynamic. Um, a good portion of members from the legislature are running for either re-election or other offices. And I'm putting a plug, I am running for Secretary of State. Um, uh, so members are gonna be running for other offices. There will be new members who will be appointed to the legislature. So you guys heard it from me. There's going to be some people who are resigning um, and there will be some new members who will be appointed. Um, redistricting lines, we probably won't get those into the middle of session. So add that on top of legislation. People won't even know what districts they're running in or what it looks like and what's competitive or what's not. Um, and you know, what we've seen, one thing that I'm most fearful of, and I wouldn't say most fearful, I'm most um, observant of, and I think we have to be ready for, is what we saw in uh, different parts of the country, like Wisconsin and North Carolina, is once the legislature shifted from Republican to Democrat, they went into a special session that changed the rules while Republicans still had control. So in Wisconsin, what happened, the Republican legislature, they had a Republican governor. Once the Republican governor lost, they called a special session and they limited the powers of the new governor before he gets swore in. And we are right for that to happen here with a governor turning out and a legislature that is Republican controlled. I am fearful um, or observant that they may try to do one of those moves. If we take the governor's office or if we take the legislature, they may try to, to do something that would limit power. So we have to be ready and fired up. Well, isn't that exactly what they did to Katie Hobbs? They did, and it's, and it's so bad, you know, um, they literally limited powers from Secretary uh, Hobbs, but, her, but the powers are only limited until once she turns out. Um, so the secretary, and, and the reason why is because there's three members of the legis of the Republican Party who are running to be Secretary of State, and they didn't want to limit their own power. So um, that is uh, just ridiculous. So is, it will strip away the Secretary of State's powers, but only once uh, Ms. Hobbs finishes her term. So that's totally retaliation and political, uh, uh, that's political madness. That it is. What other questions do we have while we've got Leader Bolding with us? Well, I think it's not Marilyn. I think we have a hand raised. Yes, I was wanting to know um, how do you, what you said we have to be ready to be active in case the Republicans do try to change the rules if we flip the uh, either of the of the bodies. How do we fight that? How can one fight that if the Republicans are still in the majority at that time? Yeah, so, so, the, so, uh, so the biggest thing that we have, uh, have, have to do, and it really, um, when I think about Arizona, we have something, basically the, the theory of change, which happens in Arizona. And typically what happens is 
if you have the legislature does something crazy, if you cause enough attention, um, you also you, you know you cause enough attention, you make enough noise, you get the media to cover it. Once the media starts to cover it, then you get the business community and the business community, and they start paying attention and they often say like, you know, what light is this painting? Then many times you have the business community who are reaching out to some of these members who are directly uh, responsible or who, who play a specific role uh, or want a role, um, uh, uh, who have a role to play with regards to like the policy legislation. So for us, thinking about that theory, uh, you know, uh, that ecosystem that we have to change is we have to be, we need to be ready to write op-eds, make sure that we're making, you know, uh, you know, we write, we're writing op-eds, we're using our voices. We have to create enough noise in all pockets. You know, people who traditionally may not be, who get involved, they have to get involved. Um, so creating a, a story, a, a news, a, a cycle that allows the media to paint uh, a message so so these members know um, that it it this is not okay um, and you know the, the media has been a way to really stop a lot of legislation literally I mean when we think about some, even some of our worst voter suppression bills would have been a lot worse had we not had people you know um, making the noise to then get the media attention to then get business community attention to then reach out to Republican members to then make changes in the law. So it's, it's this sequential approach, um, but it is important for us to think through that with regards to thinking about strategy. Mm -hmm. Melinda, you had a question? Yeah, hi, Leader Boulding. I am curious about the stated uh, court challenge to 1783 and when you expect that to be filed and if you could say a little bit more about it. Yeah, so um, there is a, a few things that I think is important um, and this, uh, we know that there is a, a few different um, targets that are happening. One, um, from a, a referendum standpoint, um, and then also a particular court challenge. I, I can't speak specifically to when. Um, I know that the, the caucus we have we have offered our support um, as best as we can, but um, I I can't. There's nothing publicly I can speak to at this point in time. Thank you, Cynthia. Hi, Leader Bolding. Um, will the Democratic investigation of the um, of the um, fought it, will that modify behavior in any way, do you think? You know, it's, so that's a great question. Um, and the thing about the, the fraud it is right now, it is actually politically, and I'm going to talk in terms of, of politics right now, politically, both Republicans and Democrats um, believe that the fraud it helps them, right? Democrats believe that you, this is a way to call attention on people who like are clearly trying to, you know, suppress uh, the vote, who are clearly like delusional, who are clearly just like not in the same reality and. Uh, many Democrats believe because of that, that's going to turn off independents and other folks who would vote for Republicans. So, you know, uh, you know, that is so politically, you know, uh, that is why you'll hear a lot of politicians talk about, hey, the fraud is not good, it's bad, you know, because politically we think it works. And on the Republican side, they believe that this fraud, it actually helps them. They believe that they are talking to a base who's asking them to do something, this Trump base. And, they, and this is their way of saying, look, we are standing up and we are fighting for you. So like when, and when, and when they go into their little small group meetings, they can say, look, we hear you loud and clear. And that's why we're putting up this, uh, that's why we have this fraud it. And well, they probably don't call it a fraud it. Um, they probably use other language um, and they're using it as a fundraising tool. Um, and this is how they're using this as a fundraising tool for them to build their own legal defense funds um, and also uh, provide an opportunity for them to, to fund uh, their infrastructure. Since Trump's no longer in office, this is the new funding mechanism for them. So that makes it for, for folks, everyday people who are just ready for common sense, who are just ready for us to get back to normal, 
um, it could be frustrating because you have both parties who literally are amplifying this, this conversation. And the reality is what we're seeing at the legislature will have a much longer, larger impact. And we all knew when they did this audit, we knew that they weren't gonna say, okay, everything checked out, like the numbers match. <laughs> I mean, did any of us really, I mean, nobody really thought that they were gonna look at the ballots and say, it checked out, it's good. You guys, you were right. You know, Trump really did lose. No one expected that. Um, so it's it's hilarious now that they're saying, yeah, the numbers didn't count. Yeah, we knew you were going to say that from the beginning. And we know it's still going to have absolutely no change and no outcome to anything. Sad. Cynthia, your hand is still up. Do you have another question? Uh no, I just I just wondered if the announcement that Democrats in Congress were going to investigate yeah. it would, you know, make them put their tail between their legs even slightly. I, you know, they're they're, they're for them. They're sending out even more uh, emails to say now Biden and Pelosi wants to take away our state power, help us fight back, send twenty five dollars for them. That's the best thing that could have happened for them. Uh, now they okay. can, now they can federalize it. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you to our speakers um, who've done an incredible job. You, all your hard work. Um, it's it's uh, totally amazing. Yes. And give you a round of applause, both of you. Um, and I just want to point out to our membership and to the people who are listening that, you know, very often you you watch the news and you hear about what's happening on the federal level, but there's so much more that's so important that's happening at the state level. And um, people don't realize it, people don't follow it. And I encourage everyone to take all this to heart, um, to speak to your friends, neighbors, whatever, about the things that are going on in, um, in Phoenix or had been and tell them how important it is to vote um, their conscience at the state level as well as the federal level. It's so, so important. And to keep aware of what's going on. So um, this has really been a wonderful meeting. And I did, um, I'm remiss in, I didn't call on Frankie Reamer who um, wanted to make a little announcement about our film club, Frankie. Are you there? Yeah, sure. I'll just take a second. Um, Mick Jordahl and I co-host the Democrat of the Doors political film group. We're having a hiatus in July, but in August, August 20th, we're going to be watching Capitalism in the 21st Century, which is a documentary based on Thomas Pickett, Pickett um, book, best-selling book. We've been watching videos on nomads and the Romani, and we're going to turn to what is it that we're resisting by having a look at capitalism. If you're interested in joining us, the uh, info is on the door website, and we'd love for you to, uh, to, to join the Zoom and to have an interesting conversation. So thanks. Yeah. thanks. And, and, and also about uh, letters to the editor. Was there something you wanted to say about that? Uh, well, we also have a letters to the editor group. Ellen, I was very happy to hear about the, the uh, letters to Blackman and Rogers as well. We do have a letters to the editors group in Door. And if you're interested, you can also email me or find information on our website to join us. We're um, trying to make sure that we amplify the, the both the good and the not so good that's going on in Northern Arizona. So we can do exactly what um, what Chairman Boulding suggested about getting the news out there, getting getting the uh, getting the words out there. So thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. I think this was a fabulous, a uh, very informative morning. And um, just as a reminder that we do have our breakfast the third Thursday of every month. Ellen, do we have any idea what next month is the topic will be or no, not yet? We're, we're still working on that, yeah. Ron. Okay, But Frankie, it'll be August the 19th. Want, this isn't about that, but Peggy just reminded us in the chat that the Sedona City Council approved the Sedona Climate Action Plan yesterday. We're very excited about that. Thank you for those of us, th those who are uh, serving on council who are with us. We really appreciate your leadership in these important issues.
Yeah. And also just um, with uh, Barbara Luttrell in mind and doing something that for the good of our community, if everyone can come over to our the door office um, on Tuesday, Thursday and, and Saturday and sign those petitions. That's uh, very necessary. The, the ones that uh, are about uh, ending the, the laws that have been passed, only you, they need to get um, signed within 90 days and it's now about 80 days. So please go to the office and sign those petitions. And uh, thank you everybody for being here and for all your help and your support. Thank Ronnie, you. yes. Ronnie, can yeah. I just, I put in the chat earlier, there's an online for statewide candidates. You can go online very easily and sign petitions. All you need is your driver's license number. And I did put that in the chat and it is apps.az.gov slash al. And that gets you, I think that's it. Nope, that's not it. It's apps.azsos. Dot gov. And it's so easy, and you can sign for the candidates of your choice for corporation commission, mining inspector, secretary of state, secretary of public education. I mean, really, governor. governor. I mean, really, uh, really easy peasy. And I wanted to thank Frankie for mentioning the climate action plan that it passed. Last night, it was a very good week to be on council. Um, <laughs> not all of them are, but this was a really good one because not only did the climate action plan pass last night, but the night before, the council approved entering into an agreement with a, a developer where the city will make a financial contribution in the form of a loan that will provide for, eventually provide for 46 units of truly affordable workforce housing restricted to employees working for a Sedona employer and income restricted. So, and this will be in the area behind Walgreens. So good week to be on council. And thanks to everybody Thank for you, sending everybody. us your- Thanks for being here. And we hope to see you at the office signing those petitions. And, um, and next month, the third Thursday for our next breakfast. Thank you. Goodbye.